Hello, this is Brian Auten of Apologetics 315. Today I'm speaking with Sean McDowell. Sean is head of the Bible department at Capistrano Valley Christian Schools, where he teaches the courses on philosophy, theology, and apologetics. He graduated from Talbot Theological Seminary with a double master's degree in theology and philosophy, and he's pursuing his Ph.D. in apologetics and worldview studies from Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. He's author or co-author of a number of books, including Ethics, Being Bold in a Whatever World, Apologetics for a New Generation, a Biblically and Culturally Relevant Approach to Talking About God, Understanding Intelligent Design, co-authored with William Dembski, Everything You Need to Know in Plain Language, and he's co-author of Evidence for the Resurrection with Josh McDowell. Most recently, he's the general editor for the Apologetic Study Bible for students. Now, the purpose of our interview today is to talk to Sean about defending the faith, his background in ministry, and gain some insights from his experience. So, Sean, thanks so much for speaking with me today. Oh, Brian, I'm happy to. Thanks for having me and for your ministry as well. Well, could you tell me a little bit more about yourself for those people who may not be that familiar with who you are? Sure. I I do teach full-time at a Christian school in San Juan Capistrano, which is in Southern California. I also get a chance to speak at schools, churches, conferences, have my first uh, debate coming up here soon on God and morality, and I also write a lot of books. So I, I just say my passion in particular is for young people, but really in the world of apologetics and worldviews. I just see such a need among this generation in terms of knowing what they believe and why, in terms of our increasingly secular and in some ways, a uh, hostile culture to Christian ideas. So I just want to do whatever I can to help a new generation of young people raising up to think biblically, to defend what we think is true, apply it to their lives, and have an impact uh, eternally for the kingdom. Now, have you seen a pretty positive response from young people today when, when they get this sort of information in light of the challenges they're facing right now? You know, one of the, the big myths that I think has been propagating around our culture is the idea that we live in this postmodern culture in which truth and rationality are no longer important. I'll tell you, my experience is the opposite. I was speaking to about five, maybe 500 people at church, and there were quite a few young people about a month ago. And afterwards, this young person who's 18 years old came up to me, and he was almost like elated. He couldn't even speak. And I said, what's going on? He goes, I've had these questions about God and about the church, and i got to know if this is true. He said, this is the first time someone's been able to help me really make sense of these. I don't want to just worship some God of my own imagination. I want to follow what is true. And that response as a whole is indicative of what I get. I mean, I think kids are bombarded with information and technology, and, you know, apologetics isn't the first thing that's on their mind, but in the right context when we motivate them, I found students have come alive, and you mentioned earlier that I put together this apologetic study Bible for students. Well, it just came out a few weeks ago, and the response has utterly blown me away. I just got an email from a youth pastor who told me that he was so moved by it that he actually said, specifically said, I I think apologetics is important, but I didn't know what response I'd get from my students. He said it's overwhelming, so my wife and I used our tax refund to go buy 35 copies and give them to all of our graduating seniors. Now, that just moved me because of the sacrifice and heart for young people, but I think it's indicative of this desire among Christian and non-Christian kids to make sense of the world. Well, that's amazing. Now, I'll be the, I'll be the cynical pessimist, and I'll say, now, Sean, this is just a repackaged uh, Bible. There are a thousand different sorts of fad Bibles why is this difference different than the apologetic study Bible? Why are they excited about this? Well, you are right, Brian. We have a Bible for everything, like for <laughs> single you know, moms who like to sew from Kentucky or something like that. <laughs> we, you know, we have a study Bible for every conceivable niche. But I will tell you what makes this unique is it, the first apologetic study Bible sold you know, 100 to 120,000 copies and been tremendously successful. What we did is we took that and really revamped it significantly. So we came up with the top 120 questions that young people seem to be asking today, and we got people who are apologists who know the answers but who really work with students. And they respond in a way that is very not just here's logical facts, but it's relational, it's emotional, it's meaningful, it's interesting. 
there's study notes throughout the entire Bible. Look, I was in a conversation with a skeptic up at Berkeley, and he said to me, he goes, well, what about Quirinius and Luke, the beginning of Luke? You know, it contradicts and, you know, it raises constant challenge. And I just opened up my study Bible, and right at the bottom were notes responding to it. So there's also personal stories in it. There's archaeological facts. And one of the cool things is my friend Brett Kunkel, who works with Stan DeReason, a great minister I know you're familiar with, mm -hmm. he put a thing in here kind of on tactics in defending their faith. Mm -hmm. So it's not just here's content, but here's practical ways to teach yourself and recognize faulty thinking and bad logic and actually respond to people who have these different ideas. So it is unique. It is different. I don't think there's anything out there like that that's as readable as this is and also just as relevant to what questions people are really asking today. Well, it seems to me from that description anyway that, you know, if I were someone like a youth pastor or something, that I would want to have that to make it more accessible, more difficult themes, more accessible to young people, at least to know the more specific questions that they're facing. It would certainly help a youth pastor to work through this because, you know, let's face it, a lot of, you know, all of us can't specialize in apologetics. I mean, there's people who have tons of different specialties they bring to the table that are all important. And sometimes apologetics can be a little bit intimidating because there's so many questions and there's so many challenges. But I think this is the kind of book that just simplifies it without making it simplistic, but would also help somebody kind of get in the mind of where young people are and just realize, okay, here's the questions they're asking, here's what they're struggling with, and here's some thoughtful ways to help them make sense of the world. Mm -hmm. now, now, your father, of course, is Josh McDowell, a well-known Christian apologist and author. When you were growing up in that sort of environment and the influence of your father, how did that influence you towards Christianity? You know, in, in a couple ways. Obviously, in, in circles, in Christian circles and apologetics, people, people know my dad. I didn't grow up wanting to be an apologist. I didn't grow up wa necessarily wanting to follow in his footsteps. I mean, my dad has been so successful and had really an amazing impact. It can, it be, it can be a little intimidating following in somebody's footsteps as a kind of ministry. I wanted to coach and I wanted to, to teach. And as I was in grad school in particular, and really in college, I started to really explore the world of apologetics kind of on my own and think through some of these issues and more and more gain a burden for this generation and also start to really kind of own my own faith. I mean, I went through a period of questioning and a period of doubting certain things and really had to know, is this real? Is this true? Can I base my life upon this? And I came to the conclusion, you know, on my own, that this really is believable and it makes the best sense of the world. And I can just say that God broke my heart and gave me a passion and just kind of gave me a peace that, you know, God's given me certain abilities, certain gifts, and certain opportunities, and that I can use that whatever level of impact it is for for his kingdom. So my parents, you know, I know some kids who have dads who are authors or pastors really kind of maybe push it down their throats and have expectations. My parents never did. I mean, my dad didn't expect me to do this. He didn't even try to make me fall in his footsteps specifically. He just really tried to raise me up to be the unique person that God had made me to be. I, I hear you there, but I bet there's a lot of people who would say, Sean, you're just a Christian because your dad was this great apologist, and if you were born in India, you'd be a Hindu. So you've just adopted the faith of your parents, Sean. Wake up now. Now, what do you say to someone who says that to you? Well, that is one of the questions we actually tackle in the Apologetic Study Bible. I'm glad you asked it, because that's a very common question among people. Don't religious beliefs just reflect where you were raised? It's important not to confuse how we come to believe something with what makes something true. So we learn, for example, that 2 plus 2 equals 4 from, say, my kindergarten teacher. But the fact that I learned it from somebody has nothing to do with where I learned from without being true or false. So when we look at the claims of Christ and the Christian worldview in comparison to any other one, we still have, we have to examine the evidence. We have to look at the proof. We have to look at the historical documents, the philosophical claims, the scientific evidence. And regardless of where somebody comes from, I think we can come to some reasonable conclusions about it. Now, we can't deny that where we come from certainly does influence us. I mean, that's I think that's undeniable. Well, there's plenty of examples. I mean, my dad, in contrast, his worldview was trying to refute Christianity. He, he was an agnostic and ends up becoming a believer, whereas from my perspective, I kind of started within the Christian worldview and wanted to see if it made sense. So, yes, I admit the force of that, that our background affects us, but I don't think it controls us. It doesn't determine us. In fact, I had this discussion with my students. 
I say, for example, take our school. I ask my students, I say, could you make an assessment of whether our school gives them a quality education or not? Although they're incredibly biased, they could still set up some objective criteria, such as how well graduates do in college, what schools they're accepted into, the SATs they get. Even though they have an opinion and they're biased and go to this school, they could still make a rational, fair assessment of the quality of our school. And I think the same is true with the religion. Even though we're raised somewhere, if we're really seeking after truth, we can still examine the evidence and see how it stands. Tell me more about the point where you had to find out for yourself and that sort of exploration or journey. You know, I was, God, I must have been probably 19 years old, uh, sophomore, and just kind of started to think through, you know, the ramifications of my belief. And, you know, at that point, a lot of people are starting to think about, what do I want to do with my life? And I really started to think, guys, is, is this really true? Do, do I believe it? Does God really exist? And part of it was I came across a website online, which is now still a popular kind of skeptical atheist website, and they had responses to a lot of the apologetics I had heard growing up responding to my dad's stuff. Mm-hmm. And I didn't know how to rebut the responses, and it really was unsettling to me. And I thought everything was just black and white, it's easy, and only, you know, an idiot wouldn't believe. And then I realized there's some pretty smart people who have some decent arguments for why they don't believe. So at that point, I really started to read both sides. I had a conversation with my father. I mean, I sat down. It was one of the most difficult conversations I ever had. I felt like I needed to be honest with him and just tell him I'm not sure where I was. In fact, we were sitting up in Breckenridge, Colorado. And I remember looking at my dad, and I said, Dad, I want you to know something. I want to know truth. I don't know if I'm utterly convinced that Christianity is true. And his response blew me away. He looked me right back in the eyes and goes, Son, I think that's great. He goes, I sense you want to know truth. He said, don't, you know, forsake what you learned growing up just for the the sake of it like a lot of young people do. He said, seek after truth, and if you really do that, I'm confident you'll be led back to Christ. Well, last year I asked my dad, I said, Dad, what were you really thinking? On the inside, were you freaking out that your son might reject his faith? And he goes, he goes, no. The reason why is I knew we had a genuine, heartfelt relationship, and that relationship would pull you through, and I also knew you really wanted to know truth. So I just started reading everything and slowly started to realize and build my own convictions that this is really true and makes the best sense of the world. It was some time ago you were on Stand to Reason with Greg Kokel, and he asked you about your relationship with your father and, and told, I remember this story where your father was in a speaking engagement, but he flew home just to be at your uh, your basketball game, and that made an impact on you. Retell that. You know, my dad was probably gone 50% of the time growing up, and, you know, that's that wasn't always easy. I missed him sometimes, and, you know, like anybody else, wanted my dad to be at a play or a sports game he couldn't be at. But I'll tell you, I've never met anybody who had such a passion for his family and went to the lengths that he could to make sure he was involved in our lives and loved us and communicated that to us. So it was actually Russia. My dad, it was right after the fall of communism, you know, a few years in. I was a senior in high school in 1994, and we had a good basketball team. I ended up playing college basketball, so it was really an important thing to me. And my dad was on a trip with a few hundred people in Russia. He flew all the way home from Russia down to Southern California, drove, drove an hour and a half home, came to my basketball game, turned around and flew back that night and I'll never forget that because that told me that you know my life and me as a person what's important to me is important to him regardless of the time and regardless of the the finances that obviously wasn't cheap so that just meant the world to me and especially now that I'm a father and have two of my own kids I want to do the same thing for my kids actually how did you yourself get started in doing a ministry that defends the faith? You know what? When I was at, I was at Biola University. There was a baseball coach there. His name is Jerry Houston. And Ryan Dobson, James Dobson's son, had been there, and he had gotten him speaking. And he said, hey, you're a McDowell. You've got it in your blood. Why don't you come and, and speak at a youth group or at a Christian school? I said, no way. That's my dad things. My dad <laughs> things scares me to death. I don't have anything to say. He kept bugging me. I finally said, okay. So I basically took my dad's talk, 
word for word and straight read it to this youth group. Well, amazingly, I got invited back, and then another youth group heard about it, and then I got invited you know, over the next four years to do a couple small retreats. And then as I went in, into grad school, it just kind of grew and blossomed slowly. So it kind of started by just speaking to a youth group, you know, of maybe, I don't know, maybe 15 or 20 kids. And then I just started working hard at it, seeing a need for it, and it really blossomed. And then as I started thinking, boy, I'd really like to speak, I looked at the issues that I didn't think many people were talking about, and it really was apologetics. You know, kids were not trained in this, don't have a clue what they believe, and that's when I really started to fall in love with it for myself. In fact, you know what it was? My senior year at Biola, I took an apologetics class with J.P. Moreland. And J.P. Moreland is more of a philosopher where my dad's approach is a little bit more of kind of a legal, historical approach. I had never heard about these arguments. For, I had never heard of the cosmological argument, the teleological argument from design. Mm -hmm. I had never heard about the argument from mind, and it totally blew me away and just kind of captured my interest. So I decided to go back to Talbot and do the whole, you know, philosophy program just with him and Bill Craig and with some other philosophers as well. So that's how I got started, and it's just kind of slowly built. I work hard along the way. Every opportunity that comes, I'll try to take it if I can and try to become a better apologist and hopefully, you know, in, increase my influence. Well, that's excellent. That was one thing I wanted to ask you is, you know, Josh McDowell being your dad, obviously his books were a first influence, but what other apologists or books were most influential to you? What are your main influences right now? You know, I'll tell you a couple. One book that's not an apologetic book that had a big influence on my life that I think every apologist should read is by a late Roman Catholic uh, author by the name of Henry Nouwen, and it's called The Return of the Prodigal Son, and he just compares and contrasts the younger son with the older son. And just how one sin is rebelling like the other son, and then the older son is this very dutiful lawyer, do all the right things, but his heart is just as far away from God. He was trying to earn his salvation in a sense. And that is so much more me than the younger son. So that book was very formative in my life. In terms of apologetics, I, I, there's so many that as soon as I mention I know I'm going to short shrift somebody, but probably in particular, uh, I would say through one would be J.P. Moreland, who just a teacher at Biola and Talbot, had him in class multiple times, conversations, read his book, influenced me. The other one is William Lane Craig, who mm -hmm. would teach at Talbot as well, watching his debates, uh, just getting to know him at times, the personal encouragement as well as just the integrity and hard work in his life profoundly affected me. And then the third one, I would say, is probably Greg Kokel. When I was in grad school, I got to be in a mentoring uh, group with him, and he's kind of mentored me ever since. So outside of my dad, I'd say those three kind of have taken me under their wing in different ways and encouraged me and challenged me and really just kind of helped me to step out into my own. You're focusing a lot of your ministry now with young people. So what advice would you give to a young person who is beginning to question their faith? They're thinking, boy, you know, I've I've heard both sides uh I've been on the Internet, and I've, I've read a lot of arguments against Christianity, and, you know, I'm wondering if I should give this thing up. You know, I would have a couple words of advice. Uh, the first thing I would say is whenever I see a young person questioning their faith, I say, look, this is not a bad thing. Doubt is good. Doubt is not the opposite of, of faith. Non-belief is. It's mm -hmm. often when we doubt that a young person starts to really grow up and own their own faith. So I see it as a positive step of somebody who's starting to say, okay, I really care about this, and this really matters, and this is really important to me. Now, I would say, you know, while you're doubting, ask yourself honestly, are you really seeking after truth? Because I found a lot of people start to doubt Christianity because of moral reasons in their lives. Not everybody but oftentimes it's because of moral reasons with a, with a boyfriend or with a girlfriend, because of something they're doing on the Internet, because of an unhealthy relationship. So I would ask the person to say, honestly, what has driven these doubts? And be honest with yourself. And I would encourage them. I'd say, find a few Christians that you really trust their research. You really trust your, their writings, because you can't be an expert in every single area. 
And J.P. Moreland and Bill Craig were that for me. I felt like they had integrity. They did some of the top work in the world. And I really read their stuff. And it helped me to really gain a confidence in my own beliefs. And I would also say, I'd say maybe take one issue instead of trying to answer everything. Maybe take the resurrection or maybe the problem of evil or maybe the cosmological argument and really search out and study one issue. And then I think that person will conclude, if they're really fairly looking at it, that Christianity is the most persuasive and then start to realize that across the board, all the issues point that direction. All right. Now, what about young people who are in the midst of uh, their high school, their college, they're going to university, and they're finding themselves bombarded with all of these different things that they haven't heard before, objections that came out of nowhere that they haven't heard before. How do they prepare themselves to defend the truth of Christianity? I'd say the first thing is just take a deep breath and realize that there is nothing that any young person will be exposed to, no fresh argument that has not been responded to before. There's absolutely nothing new. Now, it will be new to the person who hears it because they've never thought about it, and that can be very unsettling. I know how that feels. I've been in that position. But encourage them to say if they find the right websites, the right resources, there are brilliant Christians doing some of the best work in the world responding to these tough questions. So that would be my encouragement to them is be willing to do some research, be willing to find someone who knows it, and don't let this issue kind of simmer and let it go. Go seek the truth and use it as an opportunity to grow. There's been many times in my life where people have raised objections and I go, boy, I don't know the answer to that. But I go find out and I don't get stumped on the same question twice. Now there's a lot of churches that they don't really emphasize issues that defend the faith, and apologetics is a word that is kind of foreign. Uh, what do you say to someone who's in, a ch- in their church and they've really been helped by apologetics, but they want to get something going in their church or youth pastors who want to make a difference in this area? How do you kindle the flame of an intellectual defense of the faith within a church that is kind of dry in that area? I would say find the other like-minded people in the church. You've got to have some lawyer-type minds, doctor-type minds, other people that like apologetics. Get those people around you and start to brainstorm and work together. Maybe that's two other people. Maybe that's eight other people. I've heard Lee Strobel say he encourages kind of these apologetics clubs within churches to kind of get together and start brainstorming and say, how can we motivate people in the church? What type of events could we hold? And look, I've got this debate coming up. And the interest in this debate has utterly blown me away. I mean, you say you host a debate at a school or at a church, I guarantee you, you'll get a ton of interest from people, Christians and non-Christians, to come hear something about apologetics, because both sides are represented fairly. So I would say just start, start brainstorming, start thinking, studying the culture of your church or where you go to school. And think of some creative ideas to start motivating people. Now, with students, what I do is I like to do kind of the devil's advocate type of approach where I tell my students, I go, hey, I'm going to be, I'm going to be an atheist or I'm going to be an evolutionist or I'm going to be a moral relativist. And I show up and I argue the other side and I kind of beat up on them a little bit. And then I say, well, over the next four to six weeks, we're going to specifically answer the questions raised tonight. And almost always, the vast majority of students will go, yeah, I've wondered about that and they'll be motivated. So there's practical ways to get people and kids to start realizing the value of apologetics. Excellent. Now, I I do have a question on a few of your books here, in particular the Intelligent Design book uh, that was co-authored with William Dembski, Understanding Intelligent Design, Everything You Need to Know in Plain Language. What makes this book different, and why would you recommend that book? Well, I think the title, in a sense, makes it different, everything you need to know in plain language. There has been, and you know this, Brian, in the past you know, five years to maybe a few decades, utterly breathtaking, phenomenally interesting scientific breakthroughs from biochemistry to cosmology to biology to physics that point towards an intelligent creator. The problem has been a lot of these are in professional journals, a lot of these are in academic books, and they're just not accessible to the non-specialist. So Dr. Dembski, who, who I'm sure many of your readership is familiar with, has a double Ph.D. in math and philosophy. 
And he contacted me through a friend and basically said, look, would you be willing to take my stuff and partner with me to simplify this without losing the content and the core of it so the non-specialist, a student, a young person can pick it up and really get the issues? So I think we've really captured it in a way that I don't know if any other book does. And actually this year it got an award from Outreach uh, Magazine for being one of the books of the year. And the person who reviewed it said, finally, it's the book I've been waiting for, someone who takes these scientific breakthroughs and makes them accessible and interesting to the non-specialist. So I think it would be safe to say that if you were talking to someone who hadn't read an intelligent design book before, that this would be the perfect one that they should start with. I, I completely agree with this. Now, we have an appendix in the back with some of the other newer, more advanced books, but I would this is this is definitely utterly the place to start or also for a youth pastor to use with his students or a Christian school teacher or a parent to just buy, you know, for son or daughter if they want them to be exposed to some of the scientific evidence for design. Well, how can people find more about your ministry? I know you have your website and a blog. Can you talk about that and whatever resources are available there? Sure. My website is uh, pretty easy to remember. I think it's seanmcdowell.org. And that's S-E-A-N, like Sean Connery, SeanMcDowell.org. I have uh, some books up there. I'm just in the process of revamping my my website up to kind of a newer uh, technological state. But I've got my books and resources on there. I've got tons of articles. I've got my speaking calendar if I'm coming to the area. I have a blog that I, I write on about once a week. I did a recent review kind of from an apologetic standpoint of the movie Avatar, um, I'll have uh, my debate posted up there very soon that people can watch. Uh, the other thing is I'm on Facebook, so I, I'm always looking for Facebook friends, which is great. It's easy to find me on Facebook, and then I Twitter as well. So those are probably the three best ways uh, to get a hold of me. All right. Well, I'll also remind our listeners that Sean's first debate here coming up with James Corbett on February 27th on the subject, Is God the Best Explanation for Moral Values? Is there anything that you can tell us about that debate. I know this is a, a pre-debate question, but uh, tell us the topic and sort of the angle you will take. Sure. Well, the person I'm debating, his name is James Corbett, and he's a high school teacher in the area. He's taught about 37 years, has his Ph.D., and is kind of known for making derogatory and divisive statements against religion. In fact, in his own bio on the flyer, he said he's known for making provocative statements, you know, anti-religion. And he's in my city at a public school. I teach at a private school. Met him a couple times. A friend said, would you debate him? And I thought that'd be kind of exciting and great. He was sued recently, involved in a court case that was actually even covered on Fox News a little bit. So there's kind of been a lot of media following this story in this debate. And the topic is, is God the best explanation for moral values? And to me, the idea of morality is one of the more powerful reasons to think that there's some kind of moral lawgiver. So I don't know exactly what other explanation he'll try to give for morality or what route he'll take. He's certainly a bright man who's very intelligent, but it promises to be interesting. And uh, by the time this is out, it should be available either on YouTube very soon or on my website. People can track it down and watch, and I think they'll find it uh, pretty engaging. All right. Well, if there's audio, we'll try to have it on the on the site here at Apologetics 315. Sean, I really appreciate you taking the time to speak with me today. Brian, happy to do it. I'm thankful for what you're doing and, and appreciate the opportunity, so keep it up. Well, we've been speaking with Sean McDowell. I encourage those who are listening to find Sean's resources at seanmcdowell.org, and be sure to check out today's blog post for links to the Apologetic Study Bible for students and all of his other works and resources. This is Brian Auten of Apologetics 315, and thanks for listening. Auten of Apologetics 315, and thanks for listening. Auten of Apologetics 315, and thanks for listening. Auten of Apologetics 315, and thanks for listening.